and justice for all. Should you do roll call, please? Michael Henry. Here. Allison Here. 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 Could we please have an approval of today's agenda? I so move. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Do we have any public comments, Casey? Thank you. Well, we're right into the ALC presentation. So we have Emily, um, Joe, and Mark are going to be presenting for us. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're excited to be here. I feel like this has been kind of a long time coming where you've been aware that we've been doing a lot of work at the ALC. Um, we're excited to share the things that are happening and um, the progress we've been making. Uh, to give just a little background information of how we got to this point, um, the ALC was identified as a school in need um, of support from the state level based on the four-year graduation rates. And so through that support, we were connected with the Regional Center of Excellence. Um, and so Joe is here, the advocate that we've been working with, um, and he'll talk with you in just a minute. Um, it's important to point out that we were cited based on four-year graduation rates, which um, ALCs exist because there are students that can't graduate in four years. Um, however, based on the information released today, we did make some growth last year, which is really exciting and something we'll be celebrating at the ALC. Um, but nearly all of the ALCs throughout the state are in the same boat as we are. Um, last year, we worked hard as a team um, to create our school improvement plan. Um, and even though we're here representing the ALC and the work that we're doing, it's really important to point out that we have a whole team of people behind us that have been working on that. And, and we do have some ALC staff here in the audience as well, just supporting the work that we've been doing. Um, I want to acknowledge them for being here and just um, showing their support for the progress we're making. Um, so I'm going to pass this on to Joe, just so he can share a little bit about his role and what um, the Regional Center of Excellence has been doing with us. Good evening, and thank you for having me tonight. Um, again, I'm Joe Jazerski, and I am a my role. My title is a school advocate with a regional center center of excellence out of Southeast and the Metro. So I work with schools from Winona all the way over to Albert Lee uh, in Southeast Minnesota is my primary area, um, and I work with eleven different schools, five of which are ALCs or charter schools. So. Um, it's one of those things that I have had the opportunity to, to learn a lot. Um, prior to my role here, I was the director of teaching and learning in the Red Wing Public Schools, and I was a middle school principal, and uh, I started out my career as a level three EBD paraprofessional, so um, it's always a fun to get back in, in the classrooms and, and work with students and kids and, and things like that. So the regional centers of excellence have been in existence through since No Child Left Behind, uh, probably the, the phrase that most people here would re re recognize. Um, and they started working with, um, and if you remember, No Child Left Behind only worked with Title I schools. So for most of Minnesota, uh, that means elementary schools because most um, school systems funnel their Title I dollars to the elementary. Uh, when No Child is reauthorized as ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, Succeeds Act, and the application from Minnesota was put in there, uh, some of the new requirements started to include other measurements, and one of those was the four-year graduation rate. And so the four-year graduation rate tripped um, a lot of different schools to be identified um, because it's, you know, otherwise it was test scores um, of subgroups in, in other areas in reading and math and science. So our MCA scores were traditionally how most schools were identified. It was the four-year graduation rate that triggered a lot of other things. And as Emily mentioned earlier, um, I have asked every time I've met with Sally Reynolds from MDE and I've asked, is there any ALC that was not identified and she has not yet been able to give me one. So as Emily mentioned, um, ALCs are in place because students are struggling to graduate on time. And so most of the, all, again, I can't say all because I'm not 100% sure, but everyone that I, work, that I know of uh, was identified for uh, comprehensive support. 
So what does that mean? That means that an advocate such as myself was assigned to uh, work with a comprehensive support school. Um, last year, uh, there was a woman named Miranda who was here working with them, and we did some comprehensive needs assessment as well as some strategic planning and a school improvement plan. Uh, it is a three-year identification, and it, it's very rare for a school to drop off after one or two years. Um, and so the three identifications, so we're in the middle of year two. And so this year we've been working a lot on, one, looking at uh, the school improvement plan that's in place and helping to implement that. And then two, the other piece we've been working on is the information you're going to hear about tonight are some changes in possible shifting in being an ALC and there's some reasoning behind um, why that happened. So I don't know if you want me to touch on that or, so if you want to click over one. So one of those is um, the last thing on there, so we had Sally Reynolds came down uh, to speak with a group uh, of faculty members from the ALC, as well as some folks from the high school, uh, myself and a couple of my colleagues, I believe a couple of you were there, um, just to look at what an ALC means. And one of the things that happened there is there's a recognition that there were some components um, of ALC programming that were missing from the current Winona ALC process. And that's an important piece as we move forward to, because there's some funding pieces that are tied to being an ALC versus an alternative learning program um, that really come into play that are important for Winona as you move forward. So the three, the, there are three primary components to ALCs. Um, an ALC must be established cooperatively with at least two districts uh, and serve the geographic area of those districts. So, uh, and currently right now, there is not a formal collaboration. Um, on a side note with that, we were just at the, Minis I was at the Minnesota Alternative uh, Programs Conference in Duluth, and again, asked Sally, you know, how many schools have these collaboratives, and these were established in the 80s, and I, we were struggling to find anyone who remembers who their collaborator was or could find the documents to establish what that collaboration was. So I, and I'm saying that because I want you to be very clear and I want your residents to know that this is not a Winona issue, um, just like with the four-year graduation rate, that this is something that we're seeing across the state. So that's something that we needed to look at to continue to be an ALC. Um, the other is that you need to provide a comprehensive education program through a school, either a school within a school or a separate site for students at both the middle school and high school level during the core school day. And again, I, it was my understanding that previously there was a middle level program here in Winona and that is no longer continuing. Um, so again, to be a, a true ALC, that needs to be in place. And then finally, the ALCs must have programming available throughout the calendar year. That is something that has been taking place um, for years, I am sure. why that's important to you uh, in Winona. So again, there's an opportunity, you could be an ALC, uh, Alternative Learning Center, or an Alternative Learning Program. And there's a, there's a couple of different thing, reasons why it's important. It has to do, again, with a, a funding piece. You can still provide services to students in a lot of different ways, but the state will reimburse uh, the school district for some of those funds that are spent to support those students. One of those areas is in the extended day programming for high school students. So if a student needs to take a credit recovery, uh, so a class that's outside of the school day, um, typically taken at the ALC right now, um, to recover credit that they've missed, cannot use it for moving forward or extension, but that credit recovery, those students can generate uh, up to a point to um, ADM of extra funding over the course of a school year. So based upon the number of hours that they are in attendance and the credits are earned, so they can generate some funding to help support that program. So you can actually pay for the staff um, through those dollars. Another piece that you're currently not taking advantage of is something called targeted services, which is basically a similar program, but for students in kindergarten through eighth grade. So you could be running after school programs um, and those students that are in attendance would create Again, another additional dollars up to a point two for those students as well um, to run those programs. And those students need to be identified very similar to the way they are identified for the uh, high school ALC. 
but you could generate dollars to support those programs and that can also be done during the summer. So it's outside of the school year and outside of the school day. Um, in district that I've worked in before, uh, we were running uh, full summer school programs uh, and generating enough dollars to be able to cover the cost of those programs. And that can include some transportation fees, it can include uh, food for students. Um, I started a targeted services program as a middle school principal. We had school uh, students four days a week, two hours a night. Uh, we were providing meals after school, we were providing bus tokens to, to get them home, and mostly we were providing an opportunity for those students to, to gain some academic success that they weren't seeing during the school day. So that's why it's important to be an ALC, is to, so you don't lose that extended day funding for the, the current high school program, but also so you can take advantage of those other dollars. So the two things that are currently missing from that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is a formal collaboration uh, with another district, which is my understanding that we found a, uh, a willing partner who is close by, which is great, um, and then also a comprehensive middle-level program, which I will then turn over to Mark to talk about the middle-level program. Thank you, uh, Mark Winter, uh, middle school principal. And um, this isn't anything new um, at the middle school. We've been talking about this for several years, actually since I got there uh, three years ago. Um, and obviously, as you are well aware, through budget cuts and everything else, it kind of was put on the back burner. Um, and uh, you know, now with uh, working with Joe and the ALC, it's kind of been put on the forefront again. Um, so I'm just going to talk briefly about um, some of the things that we have as what we would see as a quality middle level program if we were to put it in place. Um, and I'm actually going to go to the middle column first, the program part, because that will kind of explain some of the financial impact <coughs> as well. Um, so when we look at the program, um, and something that we learned is that you have to provide it for all students, or have the option for all students at the middle level. Um, so we have to provide a program for grades five through eight. Um, so immediately it raises a few red flags having fifth graders with eighth graders if you were to have them in the same room at the same time. Um, so that is kind of where we based a program um, of having a seventh eighth grade combination program and a fifth and sixth grade combination program um, serving as half days. So half the day you would have fifth and sixth grade, the other half you would have seventh and eighth. Um, and then they would cover their core classes of language arts, math, and science and then some social skills and social aspects as well. Again, there, there are several criteria which we'll go over in a few minutes, um, but most ALC students are struggling academically and are falling behind in their core classes. Um, so that is kind of the stress um, and where we would concentrate with those levels. Um, and again, some social skills um, classes and coursework, because it is a smaller group. Um, as you can see in the last slide up there, we would look at approximately 15 students per session. So 15, sixth, seventh grade, or fifth, sixth grade, 15, seventh, eighth grade as our cap. Um, and then as part of that also to get our students out in the community, um, doing community service, um, things like that to, to expand on their education a little bit, get them more active, get them more success as far as attending school and wanting to be at school. <coughs> which kind of leads to the, the financial piece, um, which we were to look for two FTE, so two teachers. Um, the reasoning behind it is if you would do one teacher for half the day, you don't, you start running into uh, some problems with prep times. Um, if you'd run two programs all day long, you would need two teachers anyway. Um, if you do have some students in crisis, you could have another teacher in the room that could deal with students that are really struggling, another teacher that can teach larger groups. Um, so really feel it would be beneficial to have uh, those two certified teachers in the room um, for most of the day. Um, there's some staff um, trainings type thing. Um, as being part of an ALC, the idea is to not teach in a traditional manner. Um, it is alternative. And one of the um, alternative aspects that we would like to see would be project-based teaching, project-based learning. Um, but there are some trainings that would need to go with that. 
Um, so we are investigating some of that. Um, several years, four or five years ago when I was at the ALC, we did some training there. Um, the staff has really shifted for the most part, and most of the people that were trained are no longer there. There's still a couple still there. So um, I know that there's been some talk about possibly uh, combining some of the ALC current staff with our newly hired staff if we were to do so. Um, and then there's some curriculum writing expenses as well. Um, just as it is a new program, we would be looking at an uh, alternative way to teach. Um, there would be some curriculum writing um, that would also take place. The actual room and setup of the room, um, there would be no costs. Um, we have a room that would be available at the middle school. We have furniture there, um, so there really wouldn't be expenses uh, in, in that capacity. Um, the goals that we would see uh, for a middle level ALC program um, and basically is to build student success so they could be successful at a high school. Um, depending on whatever high school that would be they would choose. Um, it could be the alternative high school um, or it could be the regular high school. But the purpose of the middle level program is really to get them out of their struggles in the middle level so they are successful and can earn credits at the high school so they can graduate on time. A um, couple other, I can't read very well, it's, it's hard to read that up there. Um, actually, I'm going to switch to, uh, does it matter? Um, part of it is a transition. So if we do have schools or students that are struggling, um, the idea wouldn't be as a fifth grader to have them go into an alternative program and have them go four years. Um, the idea is to create student success, um, build them up, and then transition them back into regular classrooms with their peers um, with the hope that they would be successful at the high school level um, once they get to that point. Um, again, to get them out in the community, to um, show them community success as well. And then, again, educate in an alternative way. Um, and that's where we would see the project-based learning as our alternative way. Um, Along with that, um, we do have we do have an issue at the middle school with some failures currently, um, where we could then offer potentially some alternative programming after school and in the summer school um, have a summer program uh, to offer alternate programs for those students who are are not in our ALC but are struggling in the um, regular population of the middle school. Um, and again, the criteria for an ALC, and I'm not going to go through all of those, but um, through legislation there are 11 criteria that um, students would need to qualify to be part of an ALC. Um, that is the same criteria that they would need to qualify for a middle level program as it was, would be the high school program. Um, so those are listed. And really the most, the one that happens most often is students are just behind. They're struggling for whatever reason. The current system is not working for them. Um, so that's kind of where most of the students fall into place. And then our timeline, um, and again, it, these aren't exact dates, obviously, as um, when I put this together, I wasn't sure exact dates when or if the board would be voting on them. But um, approval, hopefully, in March is what um, I got the middle of March, but at a meeting in March. Um, and then if that were to happen, then a hiring process to start in April. Um, so we could start the selection of students before school is out. So as we're creating schedules this spring, um, we know where the students will be. Um, we can start working now with parents um, because this is a parent choice program um, that they would and could be know what they're going to be doing in the fall by June. Um, then also some staff development um, as I've been in contact with um, the organization that would provide our training possibly. Um, we could get that training this summer, um, either in June or in August. Um, so all of those are kind of falling into place, um, along with we would need some curriculum writing. And then the idea would be the program would begin the first day of school um, with potentially, hopefully, having um, full class sizes in both fifth, sixth grade, and seventh and eighth, um, because we do have a need already, we have a list of students that are about 30 long in each. Um, so 
we do feel there's a need, um, and we do feel that uh, it would be a great program for our students. So some of the things that Mark mentioned, um, the ALC, the current ALC, would also piggyback on some of those things, like the project-based learning. Um, the staff at our ALC would also be a part of that, and we would shift our focus. Um, that's an area that we we know that we need to continue to improve upon, is making sure that our instruction is alternative and um, the lessons, activities, instructions happening within the building are different than the traditional setting. Um, as we worked through our school improvement plan, we do have some suggested changes to uh, the ALC as well. We found that um, our graduation requirements and our schedule could be improved to better meet our students' needs and help them succeed while they're there um, and help them graduate. So looking at the graduation requirement changes, um, right now, the state minimum requirement is 43 semester credits, and we follow the current high school requirements, and the high school, Winona Senior High School requires 54 semester credits. Um, and so we wanted to just take a look at uh, what we can offer our students at the ALC, what our students really need to succeed when they leave us. Uh, so we came up with, um, with some changes that we want to recommend. And again, this would be something that we would come back later in March for approval. Um, our population does look different based on their, their backgrounds, their family life. And when they come to us, they're usually behind in credit. Um, and so looking at those needs, uh, we knew that something needs to change. Um, our current staffing isn't, isn't appropriate for the needs either, especially when we look at the elective requirements. With the staff and the resources we have, um, the electives for our students are a challenge. Uh, they often take um, many art classes. And so we just looked, are there things we could do for our students that would help set them up for success when they leave us? Um, so at the next slide, we'll look at some specific changes. Um, you can see the current requirements that we have and then the proposed changes that we would want to make. Um, right now there's nine credits of language arts required. We would <coughs> reduce that to eight uh, for students that graduate from the ALC with an ALC diploma. Um, the science credits would stay the same. Math credits would stay the same. Um, social studies we would reduce by one requirement. Um, the, art cred the arts area credits would stay the same. And then um, right now there's 19 elective credits and that's really hard for our students um, to meet those. And it's really hard for us to provide opportunities that really impact them and will help them when they leave us. So we, we're looking at proposing 14 elective credits, um, including FIAD health um, that we have. So based on those, um, we, we want to make sure that students that are behind don't think they can just come to the ALC and they have our 43 credits already so they're just going to graduate. Uh, we do want to have some things in place to prevent that mindset um, in students. And so we would require that students complete at least one full credit um, even if they enter with the 43 that we require. Um, and then really making sure that students understand that you cannot come to the ALC and graduate early. So the requirement is still graduating with your four-year cohort. Um, that's also a misconception out there that we get a lot of calls on students thinking that they can just hammer out a bunch of credits in a year and graduate early. And so we want to make sure we're really clear um, with the community that um, that isn't something that happens at the ALC. Um, looking at our schedule as well, uh, we're looking at moving to a six-day period um, during the day, um, looking at adjusting maybe how we use our homeroom time, how we do um, provide a little break for our students, looking at how we do breakfast. Um, so as a staff, we've been looking at different options, and we're hoping to make a decision um, in the next month or so what our schedule is going to look like. 
We also want to make sure that we're providing flexible opportunities for our students. And so if 9 to 3.30 doesn't work for them, for whatever reason it might be, it could be work. Or, um, they could also have an option of coming 11 to 5.30 or something along those lines. We need to hammer out the details on that. But having a flexible day for our students. And so it's not always the traditional 9 to 3.30. We currently do have an extended day option from 4 to 6 but that's in addition to the day. So the difference there would be the student's core day would be into the evening time. We'd like to provide an opportunity for our students to be able to do that. Then other considerations as we're moving forward and our focus in improving um, our ALC, uh, we do have some staffing that we'd like to um, change a little bit. Um, we are finding um, many of our students struggle academically and behaviorally and we don't have additional supports for those students. Um, so we're proposing to add a 1.0 FTE for an interventionist who could support with both academics and behavior. Um, this year we're seeing a, a big need for supports with reading, just students that, um, that aren't at a high school reading level. and. Uh, our team feels an interventionist that could help support, do some tier two interventions, some small groups with our students and give them the support they need would be really helpful. Um, and then when we have, when there's an escalated behavior or just a student struggling who might need a break, a quiet place to work, um, we have spaces available, but we, but we don't have the people available to support. We have a part-time social worker um, our counselor is 0.5 counselor and coordinator, which is a really tough position to have. Our safety specialist is part-time. Um, I'm a part-time administrator there. So it's very, very rarely that we have people available that can spend time with students who need support. Um, so a 1.0 FTE interven interventionist would help our students immensely um, in both academic and um, just behavior and any sort of mental health support that they might need. Um, last year, we had a reduction in social studies, which has really impacted um, scheduling and options for our students. Um, we'd like to increase our social studies teacher back to a 1.0. Um, with the social studies requirements we have and the limited options of electives, that teacher really needs to be able to provide some elective classes as well. Um, that's been a huge challenge, and as we look at um, Budgets and staffing, that's an, another area our staff felt very strongly that we need a 1.0 social studies teacher. Another area that we had cuts last year was PE and health. Uh, we, we try to be creative and we're combining with a high school FIAD, uh, but right now we're only able to provide FIAD for nine students each semester. Um, again, FIAD is a requirement that some of our students need, but it also becomes an elective for our students. And so, um, Within the school year, we're only able to support 18 of our students in that, um, and that um, that has not worked well this year. And so we would like to increase that. Um, we also need to look at a way and how we can offer health for our students. This year, um, we didn't offer it as one of the classes students were scheduled for. If a student needed it to graduate, we would have used an independent study option. Um, we didn't need to do that, but next year we will have students that will need that health requirement. And so we need to look at how we can offer that for our students. Um, and then it, another thing that is a huge need at the ALC, um, our students um, really deserve to be one-to-one -one with Chromebooks as well. Um, and so we do have Chromebook carts that are available, um, but we don't, we aren't one-to-one. -one. We don't have enough devices for every student in our building. Um, and that can make it very tough as our math teacher has implemented some online math courses, which are, is working well for some of our students. Um, for some of our students who just need independent work alone, focus on, on something, um, there's not always a device available for them. So um, that is on our capital <laughs> request. Um, but that is a big need and something that we really hope to have in our building next year for our students. So next steps at the ALC will be to work with um, the Regional Center of Excellence on an instructional audit. And I'll have Joe speak, to, uh, speak a little bit more about this, but this is something that the staff knows about, they're excited about. 
Um, I have met with uh, Scott Halverson, the union president, so he knows and understands that this truly is a way for us to improve. Um, it's nothing evaluative, it's not a way to evaluate teachers or what they're doing, but it's going to be a way to look at our instruction in general within the building and how we can improve that. So I'll have Joe just speak a little bit on that process. So when I said that the, an advocate was assigned <clears throat> to the, the school, um, you know, we talked a little bit about what we've done so far. And one of the things that I've tried to do this year with some of the schools I've been working with and I brought to our team is this idea, if we're gonna help provide and offer some suggestions, we need to understand our schools better. So we're trying to get out in our schools more. And one of the things we've started to do is what I've termed the instructional audit, I hope it sticks, because I think it's a clever name. Uh, but what we do is we bring a team of people in, and we were just at a school today, and there were five of us in that school, about the same size actually as the ALC here. And we interviewed students, and we interviewed staff for a full day. So we actually interviewed every single staff member, and we interviewed, um, I think today we got to about 32 students. Uh, on Monday, we're gonna return to the school, and we're gonna do classroom observations. And what we're looking for there is just to collect some data, collect some direct student information, some information directly from the staff to talk about what their perception data is. What's working well for you? What's not working well for you? Why are you here? What are some things that you would like to see change? Um, and when we did this in the other two sites so far, we've gotten some great information from both sets of uh, stakeholders uh, to find out what's working for them and what's not. And then those classroom observations are for us to look at instructional model. Um, one of the things that we're looking for is, what's the creativity like? What are we doing differently? What's alternative about your alternative program? It's something they talk about at the state level all the time, and it's something we're trying to bring here, is what's different? Um, we know the traditional model hasn't worked for these students that are enrolled here for one reason or another, so what are we doing differently? And we are not compliance. The Regional Center of Excellence, I do not have a, comp I, this is not a compliance component. That's not our job. Um, our job is support. So we bring that data back to the site and we present it to them and then we will sit alongside them um, and make a plan on how to improve. And we will prioritize what those improvements are. Um, you know, if this model, the changes that we've suggested uh, tonight are moving forward, um, that will be part of the plan too. How can we best support them? We are able, I am fortunate to work along uh, in the Southeast Metro region uh, for the Regional Center, we have 14 advocates. We have math specialists, we have, um, we have people who are reading specialists, we have people who are graduation specialists, we have all sorts of different people who've done lots of work in different areas, and we can provide some professional development to help support that. Um, one of the things that's come up since we put this presentation together, um, I contacted Emily and asked if she would be interested in collaborating on a grant with another ALC that I work with um, on a project uh, that through, um, and I've just lost the name of it, it's the MLCN, uh, but it's basically it's a, about trying to get student-centered learning. Um, and we could, together, if we could get that collaboration grant, what the intention would be is to work with that other ALC, and what I could foresee there is bringing together um, the math person from Winona to meet with the math person from the other school with a math specialist, and can go through what could be done differently in your classrooms and provide an opportunity because even when you provide opportunities to collaborate with your local high school, um, teaching at the ALC is really different, and you probably all understand that, but you could put them in the math PLC, and they're gonna feel like the odd duck, because, I, well, I teach everything, and I only have, you know, I have these kinds of struggles, but if you could put two ALC teachers together, along with a specialist, to be able to support that work, I think you could find some really amazing things happen, and that's something that I'd be proposing we could do with that grant dollar. So that's another piece that we would hope to be able to move forward. And if we aren't able to get that grant, then we look for alternative ways to fund that, because both schools are looking for that support. So those are, so with an advocacy, uh, I know sometimes it can be viewed as a, I think the conversations last year, I'm really glad I wasn't here for, because it was kind of like, well, why did we get identified Every ALC is saying, of course we were identified. You know, most you know, ALCs too get students from outside of their school. They have, no, they have not seen these students for the first two years. That's not really their responsibility why they didn't graduate in four years, but they're the ones kind of being quote unquote punished for that. But what I think they found, and I hope that they're finding it uh, with our work the last, uh, the school year, is that with the advocacy comes some support and some resources that you wouldn't have access to before. And so that's what I'm really trying to provide, and I'm hopeful, I think we'll be able to do some really good things so far, and, and this would be some of the next steps that we'd be doing. Thanks, 
Jo. Um, I do want to point out, we, our teachers have a really great opportunity, um, math, social studies, science, and English teachers at the ALC. Um, the principals of the ALCs in Southeast Minnesota have a PLC where we collaborate and support each other. And through that PLC, we've created opportunities for our teachers to meet um, because they're all just a department of one. And like Joe said, teaching at an ALC is, is very different than teaching in a setting. And so um, our social studies, science, and our math teacher in the last couple weeks have all met with um, the content alike teachers from ALCs um, it, from Southeast Minnesota. So that's been a really exciting opportunity for them. And we're hoping to continue that work throughout next school year as well uh, to support our teachers. Um, with, with each other. Um, so just in review, we just threw a lot of information at you and a lot of ideas and work that we've been doing. Um, but we'll be coming back to you um, in, later in March. We will share with you the agreement between us and our cooperating district so you can see and understand what that will look like. We would be looking for um, your approval on the mid-level program, on the, the credit requirements that we've proposed for the ALC, and then um, also decisions on staffing. So Mark and I know how we can move forward with planning and preparing for the success of our ALC work. Questions? <laughs> Thank you, um, uh, thank you for this presentation. I was really looking forward to tonight, Emily and Mark. Thank you very much. Um, I see that we have some of our faculty over at the ALC in attendance, and this is a good opportunity for me to give a shout out to you. I love visiting your school. I just love it. The last time I visited your school, a student stopped me in the hall and said, I love my school. Uh, you all are collegial, and you clearly have a passion for your students, and thank you. Um, I have some questions for Mark. If, don't worry, Mark. These are clear no questions. Um, I have something I just want to understand better. Um, would WAP students be with students from the other district during these sessions? Is that the vision? Or? For the most part, these will just be our students. Um, Typically, busing-wise, it, it just doesn't, it isn't very effective okay. to start moving. Now, we are an ALC, so any student in the state could come to our ALC program. Um, and if they meet the criteria, we would accept them. Uh, so there is that possibility that we could have students from different districts. Um, and, and that's part of what the law says, is any student in the state can attend any ALC they want. Um, so potentially, yes, we could have students coming from from Bemidji, and they could come here. They would have to transport themselves, um, but they could come to our school. With, with, with that said, I'm just trying to understand the nature of the partnership with the other school. I mean, um, sure. could you help me out with that? A hundred percent. I apologize. I, as, I, as you asked that question, I thought, we didn't explain collaboration as thoroughly as maybe we should have. So collaboration means you just, and it, it's really... Um, nebulous in definition. Um, I think I've asked four different times on four different occasions and I've gotten the same, whatever you want it to be is what the collaboration can be. And whatever the two sites agree on. Uh, right now I believe the, the current agreement is looking at um, collaborating on professional development. And really what it, all it means is that um, for the other school, it would mean that they could provide some of the programming that the after school programming for credit recovery as well as targeted services. They don't have to have a single student participate in the day program to be a collaborator. Um, right now they already could. Like if, if a student from La Crescent or uh, any of the other school districts around you wanted to come here, they could already uh, go there, attend the ALC here because it's an ALC. Um, so it doesn't even have to say that you, you have to allow a certain number of spots or anything like that. It could be more than that. I know a couple of districts um, in uh, like the, the Mora area, there's four different districts that are collaborating and they're actually creating satellite sites at the other smaller districts. So Mora is gonna be the primary fiscal host and then the other three districts are gonna create satellite sites at their site and run those programs there. So 
it's, it's a really, and I, and I wish I could give you a really firm definition because I keep asking for one, but the reality is that collaboration is very, just dependent upon whatever the two districts can agree upon. And the rea and honestly, it, it kind of feels like it's a formality to say that yes, we have a collaborator and we're actually doing something. So it could be fluid. Um, Mark, yeah. I have a, thank you. Yes. I have one more question and then I'm done. Um, wh where would your sessions be held? Would <clears throat> Are you envisioning the middle school or yes, we're we, going we would to, run to go to the ALC? Within a school. Um, okay. When we, Got it. As most of you know, I was at the ALC five years, three, four years ago. For several years, anyway. Um, and at that point, we did have the middle level program at the current site uh, where the ALC is, and it did cause some issues. Um, you're talking in some cases 10 year olds with 21 year olds um, sharing the same space, and it just wasn't necessarily a healthy atmosphere for our middle level students. So we would look at running a school within a school, um, having it for the most part um, for half the day a self contained classroom where they would stay in that classroom for half the day. Thanks for answering my questions. Dr. Shield. Um, first of all, thanks. It's great that this is being looked at. I think there are, this population can be served much better. And that's, uh, um, uh, I don't know if it would be appropriate to ask who the willing partner is, or is that something we want to wait with? Um, it's La Crescent School District. Okay, thanks. That was easy. <laughs> um, have, um, <laughs> have you folks, uh, you had said that there is a potential th that this can be revenue, it can bring in revenue. Have you folks figured out, um, as proposed here, a, a ballpark of what a net cost would be? No. Okay. Um, uh, can I Not ask, yet. Okay. Can I <laughs> ask, too, did your review look at the process by which, for lack of a better term, students are mustered into this? I think one of the things in the past sometimes is kids have been, well, way far behind by the time that the, the switch was made. Could you talk a little bit about that? I think that's one way hopefully that this population could be served better if there were closer monitoring so that whatever change of course were advisable would happen earlier. So was that part of what you looked at? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the intake process or to qualify to attend the ALC. Yeah. Yep, and that actually was a, a big focus of our school improvement plan and our school improvement team last school year. Um, being new to the ALC, I had a million questions and that was one of them. Like how, how do they get here and how are we serving mm -hmm. our students and are we giving them what they really need? So the state does have 11 indicators. Um, so state statute is very specific about students meeting one of them. Um, and you know, things like a, a parenting, um, significantly behind in credits, mental health, there's 11 indicators. So a student would need to meet one of those. Um, and then we have a, a, an intake process that we have laid out. And right now it really has been um, working alongside the Winona Senior High School. When they have a student, they make a referral. Um, and so we have a process where we come together as a team to make sure that we really understand the student's needs, interventions that may have already um, been in place that worked or didn't. So when a student does come to the ALC, we better understand who they are and what they need. Um, that is definitely an area that we're working on to improve upon. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and just two, um, two more. Um, first, thanks again to, for the staff, uh, ALC staff members who are here, thanks very much, and for the work that you did um, looking at this. I also wanted to ask about transportation. One of the things that was mentioned was um, the possibility of an after school um, session or sessions, and transportation is obviously critical. What kind of luck have you had in, in the past in coming up with enough resources so that, you know what I mean, you could yeah. have terrific programming and if a kid can't get there, it doesn't exist. Right, and, and that's still gonna be a challenge because the funding that's provided is not significant enough to be able to run like a full busing mm -hmm. session, which of course is the challenge because you never know, you're never gonna get 12 kids from this block to all attend at the same time, because that'd be easy. Um, but what we have been able to do is provide some opportunities with local busing, like um, regional busing companies. Mm -hmm. um, I know we have a high of transit in another area that I've worked, and we have the bus tokens. Mm -hmm. um, and as students get older, um, that becomes more of a re reasonable. Although um, in Red Wing, we were actually having some of our elementary school students take those buses and find success with that. Mm -hmm. um, but providing actual, you know, another opportunity might be, might be vans. Um, so the thing that it does is it at least opens the door to have some resources to look at. 
one of the biggest challenges you're going to have is just determining how many students are actually going to participate um, from the beginning. So you, because it is, um, you know, we always run our, I've always run my programs as they got to be net neutral. Mm -hmm. um, I'm certain that that's what you're going to want to do as well, uh, that it's not going to dip into your, uh, your general fund. Um, so the first year, we've, every program I've seen is really fiscally conservative that first year to see how many students you can get and then hopefully create a little bit of a fund balance in that alternative program so that you can then start providing some of those opportunities. So it's not, like I said, it's not, unfortunately it's not enough to be able to provide a robust transportation, but at least for some students, it's a, it's a, it can be a solution. It would seem to me that that would be a real important part of the research and down to a pretty granular level because otherwise there might be students who would otherwise qualify and, and just wouldn't even uh, apply because it's out of the realm of possibility given the um, iffiness, if not uh, absence of transportation. Right, and one of the things that I would certainly, uh, as we sit down and I would certainly push for is that your program is long enough that most of the parents could stop by on their way home from work to pick up students. That's, you don't, the one thing you don't want to do is run a one hour after school program uh, because you're going to wind up with students who are, you know, who can't come because a parent's not the home yet. Some of those things, at least in the, again in that first year and then you can build from there. And, and I would also suggest you start small and build in those after school programs um, and figure out how that goes. Thanks again. I really hope um, this can come to fruition. It's, it's much needed. It would help those, those kids. Questions over here? Dr. Simon. Um, I have, actually I have quite a few questions, but some may be able to be submitted in writing, so I'll, I'll try and edit it that way. Um, I have to open by saying I really felt blindsided by this pr uh, presentation. Um, I had no idea it was that this was being considered or it was in this matter, measure of depth. Uh, I've been hoping for a year that we'd be getting to a point we'd have a, a open and broad discussion of uh, the ALC and how it functions and how it might be improved. Um, and I say that in, I want to add to that, I have heard much, much better things about it since you've been there, uh, Ms. Casillas, than I heard before. <laughs> so I want to compliment you on what progress you've made, but that doesn't stop my concerns about that at this level we have a, an open and broad discussion. And so I'm uh, going to try and focus a few of these questions in that direction uh, because the question I have is in part um, what, and this may be, be very broad, in that what is being discussed in terms of alternative learning center type education as to whether it's been working for the past 15 years or 20, 20 years, where it is today and where it could go in the future. Um, these are the kind of things that uh, I, may, I am concerned about the next five years and the next 10 years as much as anything. And it, you know, I mean, I have concerns that what we're doing isn't the best way to go forward with this. And if, I mean, can you tell us what has been Done or what is being considered looking forward uh, in, in this area? And any of you, I know, have background in this, so you could certainly. <laughs> are you talking specifically here in Winona? Or are no, I mean, oh, just in, I mean, because yeah, as I understand it, let me put a preface on this a lot of this is being directed down from the State Department of Education. And if they're going to direct it, I mean, I know how rigid they can be, but at the same time, um, sometimes of putting pressure upwards can make, you know, force changes. So that's the kind of thought I have. Right. And so uh, it's interesting because having a, you know, a history working with some alternative programs, um, for the most part, alternative programs have been hands off from the department, which is very strange because typically um, uh, the department likes to get involved in lots of things. And, I'm, and that's not a positive or negative. That's just the reality. Mm -hmm. But alternative programs, as you can tell by the fact that many of the districts cannot find their collaborative agreements um, and those kind of, because they haven't been asked for them. So the, the alternative programs have kind of, um, because they were smaller, um, many of them are about the size of Winona. I mean, they're not large schools, not large programs across the state. Um, 
they just didn't have didn't get caught in the oversight I would say um, there's very limited staff providing work with them I think there's only two staff people at MDE who work on an alternative programming right now and so but when they ESSA included that four-year graduation rate and all of a sudden every ALC in the state of Minnesota was caught I think that sort of opened the eyes to say, well, we need to relook at some of these programs. And so that's when the state started to, to, to have these conversations about, are you still offering all of the core components? Okay, so, that's, so I think that's, from a state standpoint, they've actually been pretty hands off as so long as you had met the specific criteria. You had those 11 components and students need to meet those criteria. You had um, an ILP, an individual learner plan for every student. Some of those things they were pretty clear on. But as far as programming, they really have been very hands-off. Some things that are starting to happen. So the, at the Alternative Programs Conference this last, uh, in February, some of the things that we are really seeing is the idea of student-centered learning. Um, that we are really focusing and really combining that with that co career and college readiness piece of taking the students where they are, helping them identify where they want to be after graduation from high school and then creating that pathway for them back to where they currently are as an alternative student. Project-based learning uh, is another really big thing that's happening right now. Um, you're seeing many of uh, the ALCs that I know of and work with in, the, that are in Southeast Minnesota as well as throughout the state moving to the idea of instead of having um, uh, the, the traditional classroom, it's student-centered. So students think of the projects, we connect standards back to the, that project and that's how they meet the graduation standards as opposed to having a traditional social studies class on world history they do a project that can incorporate world history as well as make it economics maybe language arts and some other things so that's really where I'm seeing this this start to go and this would be a good kind of step in that direction the first step obviously can, can I uh, you before some thought processes, and probably take a lot longer to think through all of this, but th that kind of opens the question of, as we see more student-centered le learning and project-based learning across the board, do we see a process whereby this separation of an alternative learning school um, becomes less viable? You know, that, that within the, if you want to call it the traditional school, whether middle school or high school, that the divergence of learning styles, learning methods gets greater and pretty soon you've got the breadth of it encompassing almost everything from one end of, of need to the other. I think as you start to see more change in the traditional high school, you're going to see less and less need for a true alternative because the, the high school is already going to provide that alternative programming. Um, that's going to be a long change. You know, I grew up in the Duluth area, and it's like watching an oarboat turn around. It takes about four miles to happen, right? <laughs> so it's going to take some time, but I think, I, I don't disagree with you. I think the, the longer that, the more that happens at the, at the traditional school, you will start to see it look more and more kind of like the ALCs currently look in some places because that's happening at the traditional model. But then I think we'll see a shift in, in what ALCs would look like too. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Um, This goes in part to the present situation. Um, how much in, in placing students at the ALC, or even once they're at the ALC, do you use ACES uh, techniques to evaluate them? That is a big focus on a lot of our work. Um, our social worker and counselor are both, both trainers in ACES. Um, our staff has been trained. Um, we've Last year, that was part of our school improvement plan as well, that everything we do is really done with that ACES lens and incorporating compassionate schools in the work that we do. So that's a constant conversation in our PLCs and our staff meetings and um, PD that we make sure that our new teachers get. Um, it's definitely the core of, the, it's the heart of our school. I'll, I'll give Mr. Winter one here. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I look at the criteria, um, I recognize, you know, we accept that the legislature and their great wisdom has right. passed these down to us. But as I go through these criteria, um, maybe it's just wishful thinking, but 
how many of them can apply to a fifth or a sixth grader, or even a seventh or an eighth grader, frankly? But. Well, like I said, for most students, it's going to be that they're behind academically. That that's where it, their current setting is not successful. You're you're correct. Some of them will not. Um, you know, the pregnancy will not be a fifth grade issue. Um, they will not, um, but most of them will be academic. There, there could be, even like the EL one, probably wouldn't be a good fit because we have an EL program already that would serve them better. Um, but if they would fit in one of those criteria, we would want to serve that reason. So if, if they're there for a reason, we would want to also try to provide um, services for that. Um, and again, most of it will be academic. How long would you give a fifth grader uh, time to establish themselves before concluding they were a candidate for, the, for, for an ALC type program? I think it's, it's going to vary student to student. We, we may have some, some fourth graders now that there may be a need for that um, coming from elementary that they may come in that you know you're, you're coming from a class size of 20 into a building of 800 that it just may not be, they might not be ready for it and from day one. Um, you're right though, our, our focus wouldn't be to dump a bunch of fifth graders in there right away. Um, I would foresee that fifth, sixth grade class starting small. Um, you know, certainly we have some current fifth graders that we would look at, at placing there, um, but then with the potential of having space. So as the need arises, um, would, would move them in. Now, Ideally, as we have students there and they transition better, they get more comfortable with middle school, we can start transitioning them out um, with the hope that, that they won't remain there. Um, some, they may, um, for it just, the current setting just doesn't work for them and they may need that small setting for several years. Others may not. Would it be an alternative to this to reinstitute the house system. <coughs> I, I'm not exactly sure what the house, the current house system. Um, when we did a house system, when there was a house system several years ago, there were ten sections. Um, we are now looking at probably sixth and fifth grade. I mean, the size of the the enrollment just isn't there. Uh, unless you're going to have class sizes of 15. Um, that, that just isn't. And, and these, there's a different need for some of these students, um, just the size of the building and the size of the classes and, and all of that. Um, certainly the house system does have advantages. Um, it's just with our current enrollment, it just doesn't, doesn't fit. Well, in that light, would it be advantageous then to move the fifth graders back to the elementary schools? I don't know that I can answer that. That's probably for a different conversation. Well, I... I mean, I we're just trying to focus on that. I, I think, proposal. though, that I'm looking at alternatives, and the problem of fifth graders being identified out to this type of program and group seems to be incongruous to me in part. Um, and I wonder in that light whether a fifth, you know, fifth, Elementary, at least through fifth grade, would work better than putting some fifth graders in an ALC. So one of the, I, when I first, when we first started this conversation, the intention was to not include fifth grade. Um, the reason fifth grade is included currently is because the legislation says that the, you need to have a comprehensive middle level program that is al an alternative, and that must include all of the grades that you're currently serviced in your building. You may, you must offer it. It does not mean that you need to have you can't, because it is a choice school, you can't just put students in there. So students have to agree to it, the parents have to, the parents have to agree to it, the school has to agree that it was a good fit, those kinds of things. So you need to offer it, but that does, I think when, in our conversations, I think the intention here is to start with the older students first and kind of build that way and, and see it. But that's why, it, and so even if you chose to move to a different model, like the house model, you still need to have a comprehensive element. So the fifth grade moving certainly could be not my, not my area at all, so, but, um, but that's why that it is where it is. Thank you. In response to your, it, it is, 
difficult for me to see how these questions don't overlap and run into one another, and that's why I bring it up. Yeah, and my encouragement, um, Director Sonnen, was because I know you said, you know, if you have other questions, to send them to um, yeah. Emily Mark and the superintendent, yeah. just, you know, so you can, because I know you, I know we're going to all probably have questions as we see um, the presentation tonight, um, so that we can just be prepared. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to first uh, thank you for this important work. I, um, uh, including staff, I know that it's a very important mission, and I, I believe in the mission. Uh, my first question uh, regarding the middle school ALC and the funding source. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Superintendent Freiheit, but this will be basically earmarked for the general fund for this upcoming budget, uh, or no? I don't know the answer to that at this time. So if we're approving this prior to um, we're making the budget, we don't know what the funding we source is? We will not be approving. OK. No, it's a part of the budget process. OK. It will be included in that. All right. So it, OK. Does that make sense? Kind of. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, try to explain. As we develop the budget and put it together, mm -hmm. these programs will be included within there to determine, yes, we have the funding for it, we can support it, what are the funding revenue sources that we have to cover that? Sure. That will be a part of that development process. Okay. So as we go through it, yeah. So at the next meeting, we'll be sharing our partnership agreements with the Lacrosse School District, sure. which highlights some of the things that we're going to partner on. Right. And that is the one thing we've already done in our previous meetings. We have said right from the get go that the funding source for that will be included in our development plan. Okay. 
Um, Christy, we're, just to clarify, we're not going to talk about all these documents. We're only going to talk about two of them. Three. Three. Mm -hmm. Of them. Two. <laughs> Three. Okay. So for the, the first one that we're going to talk about, and this is probably the one that um, Chair Denzer isn't thinking about, is uh, this is the third attachment, just to let you know. Um, so this was the kindergarten or the elementary class size listing that I provided at the work session on February 29th. Um, it was brought to my attention that my Jefferson kindergarten numbers were wrong. And so this is correcting that, but then at the same time, I went back and started double checking all of the numbers just for fear that I missed something. And almost all of Jefferson's numbers were wrong. So they have been corrected. It wasn't very much in kiddos, except for in the kindergarten class. We were missing two kindergarten classrooms. Um, first grade was high by three on the initial document, or I'm sorry, high by two. Uh, the second grade was low by four. Third grade was high by two. And the fourth grade um, actually was high by quite a bit because I had an extra fourth grade class in there due to the Rios program. Forgot to subtract the Rios program out of just the regular fourth grade class. Oh. So just to provide that clarification, and then when I was looking at it, I double-checked Goodview and WK at the same time, just to make sure. And only Goodview had a change, which was in the third grade. Um, my report said 41 kiddos. It was actually 40, so it was one child. But I wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of those changes, uh, because we did discuss them, and it was an error on my part when putting the spreadsheet together. So I apologize for that. Thanks, Christy. Okay. So now we will move uh, to the first, yes. So this, the form, the first document in, the, um, in this section is the budget assumptions recommendation. Again, this was another item that we discussed on Saturday, February 29th. Um, I'm just gonna highlight the few changes that were made to this document based on the discussions that were had during that work session meeting. So the first item where we will see a change is item B, which was the medical insurance increase. So originally this said a 22.4% increase and it was asked of me to look at maybe more than, you know, look at another option outside of 22.4 and the percentage that was thrown out there was 18. So to kind of provide a range. So what will happen is, is we'll actually develop a model with medical insurance at 18% and a model at 22.4 of just the medical insurance component just so we can see what that difference is and use it for discussion purposes. If you could scroll down, please. To scroll down to um, the enrollment, G. There we go, just up a little bit more, please. Thank you. Um, on the enrollment estimate, at the time of our meeting, I had only looked at the five-year cohort, which was the same methodology that had been used for several years to determine our future or our projected enrollment for the next year. Um, this week, I had the ability to compare our cohort to several other models, and we actually came in pretty close to those models. They were very similar to what the numbers that we were coming out with, so I feel very comfortable with the five-year cohort rate that we have right now. Um, versus trying to go with any other methodology that we haven't tested. I do feel though that in the future we should continue to do the comparison to see if one does seem to be better than the other um, <clears throat> as we progress. Not having done this before for this district, uh, I'd like to have some time to be able to just have some comparison years to see where do we fall, where do we not, which of the models may be better but at this point in time, they're very similar to each other, um, and I feel confident that our model should do, do us justice during our budget um, development. Okay? And then the last item, item I, is, is related to federal funding. So in this meeting, I had said that it was going to be um, flat, I believe is what I said originally. Double check. Um, we, through that discussion, we had talked about a 2% decrease, and so I did adjust this document to reflect a 2% decrease, and I did add a column for 2021 to show what that 2% decrease would be from this year. So we kind of have an idea of what those numbers are. 
and those are the changes on this document. Now, this document tonight is just a briefing item. It will, this document will need to ha have action taken on it at the next board meeting on March 26th. Are there any questions about those changes? Director Simon. Just for clarity, um, when we look at the G enrollment estimate, the actual numbers in the column uh, are the, stay the same, is that correct? The actual numbers remain the same. Okay. Anything else? I'm going to assume we don't want to discuss those numbers as to whether we want them or not at this point, so I'm going to leave that till later. Okay. Or, yeah. Okay. Okay. Then we will move to the next document which is the budget approval timeline document. So this will be the second attachment in that section of the board docs. Uh, this timeline was put together kind of, we kind of did it reverse order to be like where does the budget have to be approved and then work backwards to try and make sure that we got a complete timeline. Um, so as you can see, the first item on here was our work session, which was February 29th. Um, our planning was a little bit uh, delayed this year compared to last year just due to different circumstances. Um, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you'll see the next item on here is March 5th, which is where you are all being briefed about both the timeline and the assumptions. March 24th and 25th, we will, well, I will be holding um, meetings with directors and principals, and Superintendent Freiheit will be at those meetings as well um, to discuss guidance relating to the budget process. So we're going to work in a team effort to build budgets for each of the buildings. We're going to make sure that revenues get assigned to the buildings um, because that's where the revenues need to be. So we're going to have a little bit different approach and we're going to work together in a team collaboration to make sure that we build a budget that all of us agree on um, that will make sense for all parties involved. <coughs> um, we will also in these meetings be identifying the most important educational needs of the students that we have today. We'll be identifying efficiencies and inefficiencies uh, that we currently see and try to talk about how could we address those and where can we find some improvements. We are going to discuss potential savings for the buildings and departments. So where are there potential savings that we could have? Um, where are some things that, you know, we thought they would be great and we could use them and we're realizing today that we don't need that and where can we cut those items? And then looking at some feedback on the budget development process. So this is a different methodology compared to previous years, um, and I hope it's a positive one, and I hope that we can continue building on it. The first year is going to be a little bumpy. There's going to be a lot of work involved um, and a lot of hand-holding, and that's perfectly fine. That's the way it should be because we need to all be connected in this, in this discussion. Then at the March 26th meeting, this when you all will take action on both the timeline and on the assumptions as well. The April 2nd meeting, um, there will be another briefing. Uh, this briefing will be about the amount of budget restructuring needed for, up for the upcoming year. So this will be, um, currently we've been seeing revenues in this area, but they need to be moved to this school because of X, Y, and Z. Example is compensatory. Making sure that those dollars get to where they need to be um, and that we're facilitating the needs of our students um, to ensure that the revenues are where they, where they are. Um, we will also have the amounts, the total amount of revenue and expenses to be used to develop a budget. So this is a high level number, numbers I should say, because we do have buckets that we have to work with. Um, and they will be estimates because again, the enrollment projection is an estimate. Uh, but it will be a number that will be provided to you in a briefing as well as how it was developed. So you'll have an understanding of where this is all coming from. At the April 16th meeting then, we will take action, the school board will take action on those revenues and expenses to be used to develop the budget. And the school board will also be briefed on the directors and principals feedback that was provided at the March 24th and 25th meetings. So you will be, we'll provide that information to you as well. Then throughout the entire month of April, superintendent, director, principals, we will all be working on budgets diligently um, working with the leaders to review, develop budgets for their buildings or departments, programs, whatever it may be that we need to develop on or work on. May 7th and 21st, 
May I add one little thing to that particular piece? Yes. Is that I know um, as our directors and principals get that, they will be working with their staff to get input and feedback also, correct? Yes. Okay. Which we will discuss at the March 24th and 5th meeting to ensure that that happens. <laughs> Um, May 7th and May 21st, uh, these will just be briefing sessions. So more of just a touch point with the school board to give you an update as to where we're at in the development process. And then on June 4th will be the first reading of the proposed budget. And then June 18th will be the action to approve the 21 budget. Questions? Cooper. Yeah, uh, Director Chair. And just as the student representative, I know I'll be asked by students, when do we know what is being cut, if there are cuts? So is that what the April 2nd meeting is, where we're briefed about budget restructuring, or is that something else? Um, so if there are a necessity for cuts, and I really don't like that word, um, but if there is a necessity to make... Reductions. Some reductions, thank you, um, <laughs> to the budget process, uh, We'll have a better idea at the April 2nd, and I'm hoping we'll be able to have a, a pretty solid conversation about it at that point in time. Do you anticipate out of this process that when you aggregate the buildings and uh, directors' areas into a single budget, that you will be, um, Put this, but that it will exceed the the sums available to meet the that the district has to to spend. Or do you think somehow? Well, like maybe we shouldn't predict that far ahead. Is what I'm thinking. Because my other, I'll give you the other question. You can ignore both of them. Um, the other question is: um, Will you give us? Will we be able to see? how you get from what the buildings say they need to a district-wide uh, budget so we can see how allocations were made. It should be very clearly, my plan is to make it as clear as possible so that you can see what the buildings came up with okay. um, and we all worked to agree on and how it rolls in together. So. Similar to the very large document that was shared last year that was 132 pages, it'll be something similar but simplified to reflect Good. schools and what, they're, what they have, um, at least from the high level budget piece, it will not down, be down to the UFARS code level. Okay, just make one comment. I truly appreciate you being willing to remove the word cuts from the budget and try and use a build up process, which I think, as I hear what you're describing, I think it is, is that and have great hopes that it works well. Dr. Kwam. Surprisingly, I have no questions. I know. I know. This, is, this has been a very different meeting for me today, so I'm appreciative of it. Um, but what I want to say is that I appreciate this timeline and I appreciate the the way that you're approaching the budget with transparency and accountability and that you are bringing the budget to the people in the buildings to have a conversation and to build that budget. This is the exact kind of thing that I have been wanting to see and I'm grateful that it is happening because I think this is the way that we build trust with each other and the way we are part of a community, we do this together. And you mentioned that, you used that word a couple times. And so I'm very appreciative and I feel very good about the direction that we're headed right now. So thank you for that. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Dr. Schiff, isn't this similar to what we did last year, though, in the sense that it's going to go to individual units and buildings, and they will be asked, no? No, it's I, I different. No, I, I, kind of like what we talked about on Saturday, the, the buildings will actually be working together with the superintendent and Christy to have their budget and then work on the building budget. Not, it's, it's different than okay. before. So um, can I elaborate a little bit more? Mm -hmm. So essentially what's gonna happen is, um, this is my vision because I can already see it working out and, and it's the way my brain works and we've talked about how, I think maybe a little differently. Um, 
we're going to identify those revenues. We're going to identify how much revenue is going to each school. At that point in time, we already know what that building's budget is, right? They can't exceed that amount. So um, the givens that we know about is salaries and benefits. We don't know benefits exactly, but we have an idea. We can utilize this year's data to help drive what benefits could look like next year. Um, and we'll utilize that. So off the top, they won't need to worry about staffing unless there's an, if, if, unless there's an item relating to students within their building that need adjustments. So example, we have four kindergarten classes in Jefferson. We have two first grade teachers. We may have to do a shift there a little bit, right? Um, so making sure that that's accounted for in that conversation, at least with salaries and benefits. The rest of the budget, they will help develop, saying this is how much we need in instructional supplies. This is what we need in office supplies. We need to, we're really looking at having this item in art class or whatever. They'll have the ability to help make those decisions while building their budget. Will they have say about people? Absolutely. They can say, oh, yep, we're not going to need that this year because that person's going to be over here if, if I don't know about that at that point in time. And we can work to shift that around and communicate amongst the team, because it is a team effort, the entire team, um, to make sure that we account for all of those people. So I think it's a little different. It wasn't here, so I can't really speak to it. Um, I think this was the attempt last year, and it ended up not being that way. So um, we'll see. I'm, I'm hoping for the best and I'm hoping that it works well and I hope we can continue to grow on it um, to make it easier that when we go into the next budget cycle, it's just, just a new year. Easy peasy. That help? A little bit? I'll watch as we go along. Okay. <laughs> um, I appreciate um, Christy, the work that you've done, and um, I am really looking forward to the buildings having their budgets. I've been saying that for a long time, so I agree with Director Quam. It's I think it's going to be a um, it's it's going to be a different process for the buildings, and I think they're up for the challenge. So it'll be mm -hmm. good. So thank you for doing this and for bringing it back and back and back. <laughs> so thank you for that. Thank Any you. other questions? Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. Um, Superintendent Freiheit, legislative update. Um, I have attached on board docs the legislative agenda from the Minnesota School Board Association, and you can kind of see that they're focusing on efficient uh, cornerstone principles that provided the guidance on this is efficient and effective school management, excellence in student achievement for all Minnesota students respective locally governed public schools, adequate and equitable funding levels to provide an exceptional election, or excuse me, education. And then on that document, they also list kind of the things that they're targeting. So within the supplemental budget, they are looking at an additional 1% on the general education formula. Um, two and two were approved at the last legislative session. Um, school safety money of 30.25 million. Um, just to continue that work that they did with the other, the previous year's school safety aid. Um, and then addressing the special education cross subsidy, they're targeting $68.5 million to do that, which is to continue um, cleaning, uh, to cleaning up that process. I guess that's probably not the right term, but then also decreasing the, the cross subsidy by 5% for districts across the state. Um, then within elections, they are looking to address school board vacancy elections to make it easier for boards to replace somebody who leaves a board midterm um, because it's rather expensive to be running elections for every time we have that occurring. And I, I've seen a lot more of those come across on the uh, uh, news wires of people moving or whatever. And then also being able to combine um, polling pace places uh, they want to continue the work and repeal the mandate and require an updated resolution um, that only if combined polling places have changed since the previous resolution. So, um, and then they're focusing on facilities and to continue the long-term facilities maintenance revenue, um, ensuring that that stays funded. 
under the taxes. Uh, they would like to see the local optional revenue tied to the formula increases. 94% um, of our school are dependent upon that local operation revenue, revenue for operating costs. Um, so continue that work and tie that to the um, basic education formula to allow districts to retain its, its buying power, as they say down there. And then link the formula to inflation. Um, they have not made increases in the general education formula to keep pace with the rising increased cost of uh, school operations due to inflation. So they continued. That has been a very long-standing um, item that they have advocated for. They are also looking to make sure that uh, we are able to retain local control um, so that boards are making decisions about what is appropriate for their districts uh, versus state mandates that come through. Um, and then uh, some other information that they also work on. So reducing mandates because we have lots of them, but they don't get funded. Um, and then local governance being, um, there's 333 elected school boards. We take that times seven. That's a lot of elected school board members. So um, that's there for your information as the organization that represents you at the legislative, uh, leg legislature, I should say. So there you go. And then you can just keep going. You've got one more. Okay. Um, question. Go ahead. I get down here to it says a re reinstate school board authority to, to determine the school calendar. Would that give us the opportunity to start uh, school before uh, Labor Day? <laughs> that has been a battle for 20 years. No, I'm aware of the battle. I know. It's um, just a way of saying that. I think they continue to keep that in the forefront. Otherwise, I think if we don't, it we will not make any headways. And I know there's a lot of school districts um, that are looking at um, a modified, that I wouldn't call it a modified, but a year-round kind of type schedule. So they're 45 days on, 15 days off, those kinds of things. So I think there's a lot of options out there. There are districts, more districts, that are going to four-day school weeks um, because it does save money. And I know North Branch School District, I am good friends with the superintendent there, and when she started, they were on four days, and they did save money because they had fewer kids missing um, school days because they could do all their doctor's and dentist appointments on those days, plus your staff didn't miss work. So they, it was, they really liked it, but they had to go back to the regular five-day week. And there's various reasons for that. So I think the, the school board association really wants to keep that in front of the legislature's minds because a lot of us, we couldn't start before Labor Day this year, come, next coming year. So it's a broader problem than just the Labor Day issue. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think the thing to think about, I guess in my perspective, I think of the school calendar as one of our most valuable resources, which is time. And what is going to be the best for student learning? Because I mentioned material, knowledge retention, skill retention over the summer gets lost when you have longer summer breaks. So I think looking at calendars for student learning versus the Hungarian economy that it was based on. Yeah, part of the work at the delegate assembly that I attended um, was to urge legislature to allow uh, for flexibility in, in setting in a school calendar. Um, and so that was something that we approved as an assembly mm -hmm. to urge uh, MSBA to, to mm -hmm. work on. Great. Is there anything I missed? Okay. 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 All right, our next item is on the coronavirus. Um, just to give you, we didn't learn anything new today when I participated in the hour, well, what, 45 minute long conference call with Department of Health. They reiterated the things that we've already sent home. Um, I did um, see, we have some communication from Mitzi Gertler, our head, um, and Chrissy Cauldron on the work that they're doing, but they're also working with our county people, Winona Health, and we have identified some resources for families who may struggle with finances, so we can send that information out and how they can get help if they should see this. Um, I would just stress that right now, there are no reported cases in Minnesota. So at this time, they are ur urging that there is no need to close schools or cancel events mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. But we will continue to monitor and stay in uh, contact with our Department of Health um, and they've been really good about sending out information. So I know uh, John is working on another communication to go out tomorrow, just as a reminder. We do have spring break coming up, so um, the Department of Health has urged that if you travel outside or to any of the level three um, uh, countries identified by the Center for Disease Control, um, it is 
uh, self-monitoring, self self-reporting, uh, what do they say, self, you have to keep track of yourself and, and if you come in from there, they're urging you to stay home for 14 days because that is the incubation period for the virus. Um, but we are not held to checking where people are traveling or anything, so um, we just urge, wash your hands, cover your coughs. If you have a fever, stay home until it's been broken without a fever reducer for at least 24 hours. So, and we continue our cleaning processes with our um, buildings and grounds folks and um, offering those items as they're available. So I have nothing new to add. Thank you. Question. What I do, do you do? have a question. <laughs> of course, I have a question. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, my question partly goes to: Are we in a position to do any e-learning if necessary? No, we are not, because we have pockets of our community and outlying areas that do not have internet access nor cell phone access, so they would not be able to actually access the material if they were at home. Have we? I mean, this is, this is an unusual event. Um, and I know if, from the snow analysis, we had kind of a, well, every child will need internet access if we're going to do e-learning. I mean, is there examination of what, you know, alternative possibilities of how we could do it mm -hmm. if we get ourselves, if we end up in a situation where, and I'll pick the more radical, the governor closed the schools in the state of Minnesota for 30 days. If he does, I'm sure that the legislature will enact something that will probably drive how we respond to that. But 30 days is a lot of school, and that, I mean, yeah, if we were to have to do e-learning, we'd have to figure out what are you going to do for those students who do not have access? Do we go out and deliver it to them? Do, you know, how do they get that information? Um, is it we mail? things home to them, you know, all those yeah. kinds of things. So um, if it's 30 days, I would imagine serious consideration of, because that's 30 days we have employees not working yeah. who are earning a paycheck. And so we would have to take cons consideration of that. So, I, you know, a thought that, that might work, be considered is because the, the biggest concern is large groups of people assembled in a, a, a relatively small area. Um, that for those who don't have internet access, we could be looking at ways that we can bring them to a point where we can deliver internet, you know, they can be on the internet and yet and not in close proximity to each other. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's in the back of my head. Okay. <laughs> if I can, one other comment is that I have real concerns about this and I've said some of them to you before already. Mm -hmm. um, and it's getting worse And because we keep using Minnesota as the, well, we haven't had any cases in Minnesota. Well, open the Tribune this morning, we have people going into quarantine now in Minnesota. Um, if you look at a national map, it is everywhere. It just you know, is not in every state yet. Uh, Madison, Wisconsin is on that map. Chicago, Illinois has five cases identified and how many more, you know, unidentified once you get to there. Uh, Seattle is a serious, is probably the most serious point to date and we can start seeing what happens by looking at Seattle. Seattle, they're, they're closing schools. They're, uh, one of the largest school districts in Washington closed as of today, I guess, for 14 days. I'm, I'm not trying to, and I don't ever, ever want to be seen as trying to close schools. I'm concerned that we're, we're fast approaching a moment where we have to have thought that through, what we would do. Um, you know, it's going to not probably, it's probably not going to be Winona alone. I mean, we're going to see Rochester, we're going to see La Crosse, what happens there. We're very affected by what happens there. And... Um, you know, we're going to be in a position of uh, trying to figure out. I guess I would ask, are we in communication with the, I mean, beyond the health department, the leadership of Winona as to how how things are going to work? I mean, yes, Mitz, not, Mitz, it, Mitzi has been involved at those meetings, yeah. Okay. And I just got an update from her this afternoon. I haven't had a chance to read it. 
but but I mean I'm wondering what happens. I have a difficult time imagining it will just be schools that close at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know our our business is going to close, our industry is going to close. Um, our wonderful neighbor, the state university. Uh, oh, they've already banned all international travel. Yeah, yeah. and there's a they're, they're they're going on break next week, and they've put out a you know similar statement to what you made mm -hmm. that when you travel you have to be careful and be be watchful. I, in some ways. I worry most about this next week because of the travel, that people mm -hmm. are going to be going places and people are going to be coming back from them. Mm -hmm. And then what do we see? But I, I just want to emphasize what I see as an increasingly serious problem. And it's not, you know, I'm not happy with what the state is saying about it completely. Mm -hmm. The state isn't, isn't preparing us for what I think is to come. And, I'm not. I'm glad what I hear we're we're actually doing here. It's you know, I don't know what we're hearing from certain authorities. We're taking it very seriously and making sure we're keeping our. Okay. Well, that's. I just want to make sure in the news and the loop. Yeah. can't go a day without talking about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next on the agenda is the important events. Um, March 9th to the 13th is um, spring break, so there's no school. And on Thursday, March 19th, elementary school conferences, 2.30 to 6 o'clock. On Thursday, March 26th, kindergarten open house, 5.30 to 7 in the elementary building. So each one of them will have one. And then our next board meeting is March 26th, right here. Um, and board thank Can yous. Oh, you want to... I would like to highlight that today the Department of Education released graduation data for the graduating class of 2019, so last spring's class. Um, the data has been verified and finalized. Um, we are going to celebrate the ALC went from 13.6 the previous year, 13.16, to 18% of their students graduated um, last spring. So um, kudos to them, the things that they're doing are helping our students. High school had a de decrease from 91.92% to 87.1% this past year. Um, so district-wide, we went from 79 to 74%. So we will be working on um, addressing those dress, uh, and that will be in the world's workforce, Pillar 5. Mm -hmm. All right, Bird, thank you. This is Director Quam. Thank you. Um, so since we had to talk about being sick, thank you for that. Uh, no, uh, just reminder, um, cough and sneeze, elbows please. Um, I learned this from my preschooler. And also, when you wash your hands, sing for 30 seconds. Happy birthday, twinkle twinkle, um, Lizzo, anything. Just sing something for 30 seconds. Um, my children have taught me how to wash my hands, so I'm going to share that with all of you, whoever's listening. And then the, the other thing I want to share is that I um, am the board committee, board member rep on the wellness committee. And at the meeting last week, we learned, I think it was last week, could have been this week, I'm losing track of time. Um, we learned that the school meal debt is in the multi-thousands. I didn't ask for permission for what that number is, so I'm not gonna share it, but I am gonna say that uh, it, it, it's equal to several thousands of lunches. So if people are thinking about maybe making a contribution to something, um, Feed the Kids would be a great program to give some money to. And also if people are aware of any organizations that do fundraising in the community and they're looking for something that they could annually fundraise. This was something we talked about in our meeting. Um, it would be really great if some organization in town committed to raising money every year for um, our children. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's several thousands of lunches that are not being paid. Um, thank you. Director but they're still eating. Sure. I'd like to thank uh, Amber Scott, kindergarten teacher at Jefferson. She's an excellent teacher who cares uh, about her colleagues and she cares about our district. Thank you, Amber. Okay. Director Shield. Yes. Superintendent Friday. 
I would like to um, sh give a shout out and a thank you to Mitzi Gertler and Kiss Chrissy Kodron. They have been doing an excellent job of keeping up to date um, on the uh, situation with the coronavirus and providing great detail for myself. And then also John Casper, who has done an awesome job of communicating information out, and I know he will continue. So thank you very much, Mitzi, Chrissy, and John. Thank you. Um, I'd like to do a shout out to Christy and Superintendent Freiheit and Emily for helping put together all of the information we had for the work session on Saturday. It was, um, it was a good meeting and we covered a lot of ground, but I know the work behind the scenes, um, we don't know how many hours that takes, so thank you for that. Um, and then a shout out to Luke Merkowitz, who is a semi-finalist for the Hall of Fame for the teachers. So. Congratulations, Luke. Director Sonneman. I'd like to offer, uh, take a moment here to recognize the athletes. Uh, congratulations to um, our state champion wrestler, and I uh, apologize, I'm not great on names, but. Ryan Helgerson. Brian? Ryan Helgerson. Ryan. Ryan. Correct. Hankelson. Ryan Henningson. 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 Ryan Henningson. Um, and our swim team members, we had two relays win state championships, we had individuals win, uh, and the team placed fourth overall. Uh, some of the Twin City teams have greater, great, much greater depth, but with the individuals we had, we did excellent. And can, they all uh, should be uh, very proud of their accomplishments. Thank you. Director Hanman. We'll pass. And Cooper. I would like to thank Christy and everyone working with her on the budget, because it's really helpful for me as a student to try to understand everything, and you've done a really good job at helping me understand so I can relay that information to students. So thank you. Thank you. And I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.